Okay, I think that our academic five minutes have passed. I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the organizers uh, representing uh, the Center for Arctic Policy Studies, uh, the research project Denmark and the New North Atlantic, and the Edda Center of Excellence. Um, we will be trying to facilitate a discussion here at this conference on the current and potential restructuring in the circumpolar north with a focus on the West Nordic Arctic, uh, North Atlantic, and subarctic regions. Uh, particular attention will be paid to identity politics with focus on the processes that construct majorities and minorities, core and peripheries. We will be focusing on the multiple transnational effects of colonial ties, a collective colonial history, touching on aspects such as climate change, industrial activity, increased mobility on sovereign and indigenous rights, economic interests, and cultural issues. Now, an integral part of this discussion is the current transnational jockeying to carve out a role in the re-territorialization of the Arctic as a natural resource base, an ecosystem, and potentially contested cultural and political terrain. In addition to vertical perspectives of policy making, this symposium will also look at the vernacular practices of these political, cultural, and territorial discourses. Now, in addition, the conference will address the recent counter-narrative produced in the public arena and in the arts. Very uh, ambitious aims, and in the interest of not having a uh, crypto conference, uh, we will be having a discussion to clarify more what we're speaking about and, and perhaps touch on those issues which we don't manage to cover in our presentations. But the first of our keynote speakers is uh, Dr. Michael Herzfeld. He is a Ernest E. Monrad Professor of Social Sciences in the Department of Anthropology in, uh, in Harvard University. Interim Director of uh, Greek uh, Studies, Modern Greek Studies, and Coordinator of Thai Studies there as well. So you forgive me for not having remembered that without checking the text. Um, so his research interests include social theory, history of anthropology, social uh, poetics, politics of history, um, and Europe with uh, a focus on Greece and Italy and of course, Thailand as well. And uh, the title of his keynote talk is Where Ambiguity <clears throat> Serves the Interests of Power, Testing the Fuzzy Edges of Crypto-Colonialism. <clears throat> Please. Thank you very much, uh, Christine. It's a very Great privilege uh, and pleasure to be here uh, for my first time in Iceland. And I have to say that I will be speaking from a position of abject ignorance about matters Icelandic. Um, and I came to this conference more to be instructed than to instruct. So although I'm going to give you an overview of the project that I'm about to launch, which is a book project on the concept of crypto-colonialism, which my friends here assures me is quite relevant to the Icelandic situation, I'm going to talk about the two countries, two of the three countries that I know best, namely Greece and Thailand, and only at the end draw in a few uh, uh, hints about perhaps ways in which we might find it useful for this conference. It's great to be the first speaker because you're a captive audience and you thought you were going to hear about uh, this region of the world and I'm free to talk about almost every other place except um, the North Atlantic. Um, let me get this where I can operate it. So, um, that's, sorry, that shouldn't have been there. Um, the title of the book uh, that I propose to write at the moment, I think of it as Dominion in Disguise. Um, I'm interested in those countries that sit on the periphery of the colonial projects and were never actually colonized militarily, but were proclaimed as independent states on highly conditional terms. In other words, you have a culture and you create yourself as a nation state in the way we tell you to, or else we will invade, or we will not support you. So 
In the case of Greece, we will let the Ottoman Empire reabsorb you. In the case of Thailand, we'll do to you as we've done to everyone else on mainland Southeast Asia and simply take over. Um, they, these countries continue uh, to entertain what I think of as a segmentary social structure, uh, very much in the classic Evans Pritchardian sense, but not necessarily related to lineages or any kind, particular kind of kinship system. And this allows them to resist the imperatives of living in a centralized bureaucratic polity. They encase within set borders uh, some notion of a collective national culture. Now, we've all discovered over the last two centuries how easy it is to present the notion that having a culture is something natural. And we also, as anthropologists, know that it isn't at all natural. It's a cultural and rather recent historic invention. Um, and therefore, to think of culture as a process, just as we think of segmentation as a process, is subversive of this old colonial uh, and dominant country model. All of these countries, moreover, are concerned with the security of their borders. And the Cold War was a particularly interesting case in point because the minority groups in both Thailand and Greece, uh, to take the most obvious examples, were always suspected of being communist sympathizers, in large measure because they were transhuman, they were semi-nomadic groups that kept traversing the borders that had been set up. But the borders were set up in all of these cases by um, cartographers working either directly under the influence of, um, uh, of, of the colonial powers or under local governments that had been told precisely, you get yourself a set of borders, you get yourself a set of documents like passports so that everybody knows who's who. If you cannot contain yourselves precisely, we're going to have to invade you because we don't like anything fuzzy on our edges. Mary Douglas, I think, would have agreed very, very richly with this, with this analysis. Now, um, I mentioned Greece and Thailand as most obvious examples, but let me put you out of your misery by mentioning a few others. Um, Iran, Afghanistan, Bhutan, Nepal, Ethiopia before the Italian invasion, and at the outer edges of possibility, three surprises, China, Japan, and I'm reliably informed, Iceland. All right. Now, we'll start with the examples of Greece. And what I'd like you to be thinking about is how much of what I tell you of Greece and Thailand, I'm sorry, how much of what I tell you about these two countries immediately strikes a chord, and how much of what I say provokes in you the thought. But that doesn't apply to us. That doesn't apply here. The way I propose to use the model of crypto-colonialism is not as a taxonomic device, not, in other words, a way of saying, this is and this is not crypto-colonial. That is the old butterfly collecting mode of doing anthropology and all sorts of other academic disciplines, and I don't think it's very helpful. Rather, I see this as a heuristic model, one that not only shows us the similarities, but in the process also shows us why no two cases are exactly the same, so that it actually helps to open up our minds to interesting and revealing differences. But the similarities are what we start with, and they are sometimes rather startling. Thailand, for example, has an older name, Siam, or Siam in English. And it actually has a double name even today, because although nobody officially calls it Siam, they do use two terms, Mung Thai, which is a reference to the old segmentary structure, and Pratet Thai, which is literally Thai country and has implications of the modern state. Greece, again, um, it's a long and complicated history that I've written about in other contexts. I would simply say this, that there is a conflict between the model of Greece, the inheritor of the classical Greek mantle, Elas, Elava in modern Greek, and the notion of being descendants of the Byzantine, Ottoman, etc., multicultural, uh, very confusing uh, empire uh, or empires, uh, being Romyi, being people who were adherents of the Eastern Orthodox religion, not necessarily Greek-speaking, but insofar as they were Greek-speaking and called their language Romaica, this was in opposition to classical Greek and its more recent imitations. Both countries have had very troubled relationships with their monarchies, 
and have also had monastic traditions that are very closely related to the monarchy. Now, the Greeks got rid of their monarchy um, in a sort of double movement before and after the fall of the, of the military regime in 1974. Uh, the Thais still have a monarchy, but people are very nervous about what happens next because we're reaching a point of major conflict in Thailand over this. Historically, there are similarities between the two countries. In 1860, um, the uh, uh, French fleet besieged the port of Piraeus in order to express support for the monarchy. Around the same time, the French, that was, sorry, the French and British fleets, actually, around the same time, the French besieged the port of Krong Te in Thailand um, because they uh, thought that the Thais were not going to give them the kind of, of um, uh, commercial relations that they wanted. So there was clearly the threat of military and naval, especially naval pressure in both cases. The similarities start to become much more similar in the 20th century. In the Cold War, you have the concern, again, with the minorities traversing the borders, suddenly becoming potential for uh, communist infiltration and the idea that communism is an alien ideology, it's very deeply rooted in the official ideologies of both Greece and Thailand. Um, there are street revolts and military coups that follow remarkably parallel uh, trajectories. In 1973, the students of Thammasat University rose up in revolt. Many of them were horribly slaughtered uh, and then uh, a series of subsequent events led to the collapse of the military regime. And two months later, the students of the Polytechnio in Athens rose up in revolt against the junta, against the military regime there. Uh, and they held up placards that said, Apopse Thakini Thailandi, tonight will be Thailand. So uh, it became very clear that there was actually some mutual knowledge. And even in 2009, with the financial crisis in Greece, and the conflict between the red shirts and yellow shirts in Thailand, although these are often represented as unrelated and different sets of events, they have to do also with formerly predominantly rural countries coming to terms with the fact that the capital is now out of sync with the rest of the country and that the country as a whole is embedded in economic relations of severe inequality with, with dominant powers. So there are some strong parallels. Here, in fact, you see the whole paradox of Thailand, the red shirt demonstration in a street named for the monarchy, uh, and with portraits of the king and queen all down the center. And at the back, ultimate irony, a, a monument called the Democracy Monument, is actually a monument to a military coup that brought down the absolute monarchy and supposedly replaced it with a constitutional monarchy, whether in fact it is a constitutional monarchy is a matter of considerable debate in Thailand today. Uh, that's a very bad and muddy photograph. That's from the Polytechnic uprising in Athens. Uh, sorry, that was actually, no, that's the, yeah, that's right. Those are both from Athens. Now, a key notion that I want to um, develop here is the importance of culture. It's very easy to talk about countries as having cultures. And as Richard Handler has pointed out, this is simply an extension of the early modern European notion that to be a full human being, you had to have property. And so people have a piece of land, and countries have territory, but they also have culture. He wrote an essay, an essay actually titled On Having a Culture, thereby undercutting the obviousness of this idea. Some people were totally seduced into this idea, especially, I would say, social scientists who did not continue to follow the progressive disenchantment of anthropology from such ideas. And of course, the most uh, striking example of this is Samuel Huntington with his now infamous book, The Clash of Civilizations, in which he actually dared to count the number of actual civilizations and say that they couldn't communicate with each other. The very fact that his work was then uh, among other things, adopted by the dictator Tujman in Croatia as a justification for genocide is a perfect disproof of his theory, since obviously Mr. Tujman didn't mind reading a translation into Croatian. 
Um, a more gentle version of the thesis that cultures are things is represented by Joseph Nye, another old cold warrior from Harvard, I'm afraid, um, talking about soft power. But this is actually a more useful concept because it recognizes that what is interesting about something like culture is less what it is as what it can be used for. And that seems to me to be a conceptual framework that is much more compatible with current anthropological thinking. Um, what happens then is that as governments start to advance the idea of a national culture, they attempt to make the different uh, areas of their countries with very different cultural patterns coagulate by instilling into them an inevitable sense, or I should say a sense of the inevitability of these local versions being actually versions of a common shared national culture. And anyone who stays outside of that is considered to be uncivilized. Um, in fact, in Thai, the expression konbanok, the people who live on the outside, is quite commonly used for especially minorities considered to be lacking in something called quam siwilai, and I don't think you need to be an expert in etymology to figure out where that word came from. The formal word, by the way, in Thai for civilization is arya tam, which is arya dharma. So there's a long history of imitation of external models. Now, the persistence of segmentation as a mode of social interaction uh, in these countries, as indeed in probably most societies in the world, is overlaid in the crypto-colonial countries by the insistence on a national culture. In Greece, the distinction between insiders and outsiders, the kimas and xeni, is a very common, ordinary, everyday phrase, now usually just translated as foreigners versus Greeks, but it actually can be used to mean outsiders and insiders to any level, family, village, local community, whatever. And in Thailand, the notion of the Meng, remember I talked about the two names of Thailand, Pratet Thai and Meng Thai. The Meng is actually a relativistic concept. It's like the word community in English. Um, it can be used to mean your village community, the region, uh, a capital city or a large city, and the country as a whole. So that when Thais talk informally about going home, they'll usually say, we will go back to Mung Thai because they think of it as this very friendly and sort of oscillating space rather than as a bureaucratically uh, organized entity. And um, there's a deep historical reason for this. This is the symbol of Bangkok, um, King, I'm sorry, the, the god Rama riding his elephant. Um, authority can, in fact, exist in a segmentary system, but it is entirely relative. And my colleague, Stanley Tambaya, has shown that all over Southeast Asia, this is from Indonesia, from Borobudur, the traditional capital cities of the region were all designed on the model of the mandala. This is a Tibetan mandala. And you can see immediately, just looking at that design, that one can imagine all sorts of communities but all somehow being concentric with each other. So the capital city is then a model for the way people understand the land as a whole. When the power at the center is strong, it attracts a larger penumbra, the red part, if you will. Um, and by the way, I suppose it's a nice coincidence we have red and yellow on the same one, given the recent history of Thailand. But anyway, when the king's authority is weak, it shrinks to the center. And it is precisely this relativistic understanding uh, as opposed to the pyramidal top-down model that I think uh, inspires most people's not necessarily very conscious uh, sense of belonging rather than the official model. This is a, an aerial view of modern Bangkok, and you see a little bit of the same design. Actually, my own field site is somewhere just next to that uh, temple up there. Um, but the whole structure, of course, is now overlain by uh, the, the, the concrete jungle of the modern city. Nevertheless, if you look at the main monuments of Bangkok, you can still see the layout is very much that of the mandala. Uh, it's remained that way. Now we go to Greece, and I talk about the Xenos within. This, these are the presidential guards, formerly the royal guards, another example of monarchic flow, if you will. 
Um, but what's interesting is that they are always taken as being dressed in the national costume of Greece, associated with the clefts who fought the war of independence against the Turks. Now, that's a really egregious simplification of history. The clefts, cleftists were, th were called that because the word means thieves. They were sheep thieves, like the people I worked with in, in Crete. Um, they coalesced in bandit groups to fight an external uh, enemy who wasn't always the Turk, and some of them were, in fact, Turkish-speaking Muslims themselves. Uh, but as the power of the nationalist movement grew, obviously that attracted to it more and more of these people. And so most of them ended up being on the side of the angels when finally Greece became an independent state. Those who didn't were immediately denounced as bandits and called listes, a different word derived from classical Greek, in contradistinction uh, to the uh, term kleftes, which was given a neoclassical form, klefte, in order to make them sound like national heroes and to stop people from remembering the etymology of the word. Remember what Levi Strauss said about myth being a machine for the suppression of time. You have it right there. That's a good example of something we were just talking about. But in fact, if you look around the borders, you see that the neighbors of Greece wear very similar costumes. The colorings are a bit different, but unfortunately on this one you can't see their, their pleated skirts. These are Albanians who actually come into northern Greece to give a performance. And nowadays, people are becoming more and more aware that much of the Balkans shares a common culture, that this kind of skirt was actually probably in the 18th and 19th centuries worn far more by people whose native language was not Greek. And even those who did speak Greek would not have called their language the Hellenic language, Elinica, they would have called it Romaica. So what you're seeing here is a segmentary principle applied to culture. Culture itself is relative to situations. Nonetheless, the neoclassical model dies uh, hard. It's still very influential. Here you see, well, what on closer inspection turns out to be a hairdressing salon. And I now know who speaks Greek because he's laughing more than anyone else in the audience. It's pretty funny, actually, because what it has is very sort of classical looking um, uh, architrave over the door and a statue of Hermes, uh, you see the top photograph uh, in the window. Uh, this is making a claim that going to a coiffeur, which is after all a Western European notion, is somehow merged with the classical notion. In other words, what you see is a solidification of a single model of culture that is aligned to notions that were very much invented in the West. This is a little less true of Thailand, as we'll see in a moment. Now, this, you might say, was a scene from good old England, except that when you look more closely, you see that the scenery is all wrong. This is, in fact, in Corfu, one of the few places uh, in Greece that actually was part of an empire other than the Ottoman Empire. Um, and, uh, in fact, it was part of the British Empire, and they still play cricket there to this day. Uh, I don't know why that got in at the same time. Back to Thailand, King, King Rama V, Chulalongkorn, the great westernizer, and his opposite number in Greece, King Otho, the son of Ludwig the Mad of Bavaria. And you notice that they're wearing very similar kinds of uniforms. To be a monarch, was to import a Western European model that made these countries fit to take their place in the family of nations according to the, what the colonial powers themselves dictated. This is the king of Nepal, the last king of Nepal, same story. This is the Shah of Iran, same story. Look at the uniforms, again, they're all very similar, right? And this is a stamp from Iran from the days of the Shah showing the ruins of Persepolis because as with the kings of Greece who were Germans and Danes, so the Shah of Iran was a common person, a commoner, a soldier in fact, who somehow managed to reinvent himself as the heir to the ancient glories. Here we have the ceremony of the uh, what was it, I think, two and a half thousand years since the creation of the buildings in Persepolis, which, of course, the, the um, Shah tried to benefit from. And back to Athens, we have the plans, not made by a Greek architect, but by, a, of course, a Bavarian architect, for 
uh, the royal palace to be placed, guess what, within the Acropolis. Fortunately, that one was never realized, but you can see what they had in mind, and it's archaeologically pretty terrifying. Instead, they went for more symbolic gestures. Here's a later uh, coin, the king of uh, George I of Greece, um, showing uh, the lettering around the side as slightly archaic classical Greek lettering. But Constantine II, the last king of Greece, uh, preferred to count himself back to the other Constantines who had ruled in, in Constantinople, so he used the Byzantine lettering around his head. Back to Thailand, Rama IV, the father of, um, of uh, Chulalongkorn, you saw a moment ago. Uh, Rama IV, Mongkut, was the uh, king of The King and I, and the suppression of that film in Thailand tells you a great deal about the embarrassment that Thais feel at any suggestion that they were lacking in civilized ways. The thought that she claimed that he had concubines was known to be something that would have horrified Victorian sensibilities and therefore had to be suppressed. But notice again the framing of the monarch in a way that looks Thai, except that the use of the throne uh, is certainly a European model as well. The current king couldn't be more Western looking in his tuxedo. And this is actually um, a portrait from the community where I'm working. But this is a portrait in the center of town, right near where the riots took place, the red shirts, Rata Basong. And notice that the inscription is in English. On the other hand, taxi drivers uh, often have, because they are thought to be mostly anti-monarchist, in order to protect themselves, they put inscriptions like this on the outside. This says, we love our king. Literally, we love him who is in the place, meaning the palace. This is the king's daughter signing a uh, gift to uh, one of her most faithful retainers. And notice the Western accoutrements on the table. This is, in fact, the table as laid for King Rama V at the end of the 19th century. And you don't really see a huge amount of difference in style. But King Rama V had the last laugh. And I want to put this to you as a way of thinking about crypto-colonialism. And anyway, I think most people in this room like their food, so let me do it with food. In Thailand, you do not eat with chopsticks unless you go to a, 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 a noodle shop. And you never put your fork in your mouth, which drives Americans crazy, by the way, because they're used to eating with just a fork and nothing else. You eat with a fork and spoon, two-handedly, and you push with the fork and cut and scoop and eat with the spoon. Now, Rama V decreed this, saying that the food was already cut up in the kitchen. But my hunch is that this was a quiet revenge for the crypto-colonial situation in which he found himself. We will adopt Western ways, but we will then create our own rules for their use. And so then anyone who comes from the West and doesn't master those rules will be seen to be an uncouth lout. And in fact, if you speak Thai, you'll hear some pretty unfavorable comments about anyone who sits and eats and sticks his fork in his mouth. The food itself is quite uh, variable. And one of the things you notice is that it's also presented in an egalitarian way. There are no courses. So if Jack Goody is right that the elaboration of the sequencing of a meal has to do with the elaboration of a class structure, what you see here is great elaboration, but also it's denial. Huge variety of dishes, but all arriving together. And by the way, if you go to a Thai restaurant in the West and they bring you appetizers first and then the main course, that is a purely concession to Western habits. The palace, the Grand Palace itself, is a perfect expression of the same ideology. It's designed by an Italian architect, but working to the orders of the royal family, produces Thai uh, ornament on what is clearly a, a very Western-inspired 19th century imitation of Italian Baroque um, uh, building. You see it up close, it's even clearer. The Royal Hotel in Bangkok, a perfect illustration also, Corinthian columns with behind them scenes from the old 
palace view of, um, of Bangkok. If you actually listen to people associated with authority in Bangkok talking about the city, you would assume that there are no vernacular settlements anywhere in the city, which is a bit absurd for a city of at least 12 million people. But in fact, all the historic conservation efforts seem to go into, or most of them, seem to go into preserving temples and palaces and ignoring uh, domestic architecture. In the process, what you see is this strange combination of the adulation of the West and the presentation of Kwan Pen Thai, of Thainess, but as something that is framed in this very Western way. So this illustrates, I think, the argument I'm trying to make that those countries that can reasonably be called crypto-colonial evolve the notion of an independent national culture in a framing that makes it palatable to the Western colonial powers and thus discourages the Western powers from invading on the grounds that, after all, this is a more or less civilized country that could be more or less trusted to police itself. Now, unlike Greece, Thailand could not claim to be the ancestor that had given the light to Europe, which is a story that I think the great, leads to the great tragedy of modern Greece, basically the rejection of everything that couldn't be traced back to classical Greek uh, culture, and a, a model of classical Greek culture, by the way, that had very little to do with most of the Greek-speaking world. It was all based on 5th century BC Athens, which is a very narrow piece of the whole thing. If you look at the role of language, um, uh, you see that the modern Greek language now has been effectively purified of much of the Turkish, Arabic, Slavic, Romanian, Albanian, etc. influences. Um, and that purification process, which actually led to the creation of a fake neoclassical language for most of the country's history, only abolished officially, in fact, in 1976, uh, has the effect that now, anytime you need to invent a new word, you can pull it out of ancient Greek, and people will know more or less what it means. So everything from internet, which is now often called the addictio, uh, to anthropology, anthropologia, words about people. Of course, we know that in classical Greek, anthrop the anthropologos was a gossip. That's OK, too, um, because that's what we study, essentially. Um, but um, it, it does mean that um, people have a sense of understanding the words. In Thailand, the words are all taken out of Sanskrit, and Sanskrit is very, very strange to most people. So when I say thetikismos in Greek for positivism, a Greek immediately understands something because thetikos, positive, is an everyday word. If I say patitaniom in Thai, most Thais say, what's that? They've never heard of it because it's Sanskrit and it has nothing to do with the spoken language today. In fact, one of the oddest things about, about uh, the use of Sanskrit in Thailand is that most of those long surnames that you are used to thinking of as typically Thai are not typically Thai at all. Most people of ethnically Thai origin have two or three syllable surnames. These long ones are Sanskrit names that were invented for or by people of Chinese origin who were desperately trying to disguise their Chineseness, but overdid it and thus became identifiable as Chinese by the length of their names. So you get names like Suputamonkun and Konantakun and Akaraprasurkun. And you know, those are not people who are ethnically Thai. Um, very quickly, um, so Greece looked to its ancient letters and to the Acropolis as the model, and it occupied a very affective space in people. This is a, a votive plaque that somebody obviously put in a church probably to express some kind of patriotic feeling. And the Erechtheum got imitated in 19th century domestic architecture. This is somebody's private house in the Piraeus in the 19th century. The domestic space was worked on very effectively as a way of controlling the body politic and bringing it into line with the idea of a single culture based on classical Greece. What people forget is that the interiors of the houses continued to look remarkably Ottoman, Turkish, folksy, etc. And the ideology can be turned against itself. So we see, for example, the use of ancient or neoclassical monuments with inscriptions that portray revolution. Um, ancient proverbs 
used against the ruling clique, and actually pieces of the neoclassical buildings made by these Bavarian architects were hurled at the police during the riots in what, to me, is the clearest expression of a country beginning to realize that this is an ideology that has oppressed them for a long time. Now, these models have been exported. I'm just going to throw this out as a, uh, um, a quick thought that might animate some further discussion. The United States strikes me as the only country in the world that is politically imperial, still is, but culturally post-colonial. And as somebody who lives there with a British accent, I can assure you that that accent gets exactly the kind of dual reaction you would expect in this sort of situation, namely uh, hostility and adulation at the same time. More of the latter, but you, if somebody says to you that, you know, Europe, you, you Brits have a very high sense of culture and you dare to agree, you're in trouble. <laughs> Chinese versions of the same thing. This is from uh, Shanghai. The combination of the old Chinese quarters now being gentrified in a way that is clearly controlled by a Western aesthetic and surrounded by Western-style modern buildings, and a lot of it harking back to the restored 19th century grandeurs, with notice the same kind of uh, Corinthian capital in gold that I saw very recently, uh, for example, in Tartu in Estonia, that you see everywhere uh, in Europe. Uh, it's clear that this model uh, is a sign of some kind of cultural domination. And one would want to ask whether Shanghai might prompt the thought that China, and for similar reasons Japan, could be seen as limiting cases for the crypto-colonial model. So I promised I'd have some Icelandic questions to end up with. Um, this one actually caught me uh, uh, by, uh, yesterday as I was flying here on the Iceland Air uh, flight uh, from Copenhagen. The Icelandic open sandwich, right, which I must admit quite good, is admitted to be Danish and was something that was not, you are assured, in the menu, the cause of the Danes' departure from, from uh, uh, Iceland, if in fact they did depart. Um, but there is a certain, what should I say, edginess, I think, about that whole uh, advertising stuff. It's amusing. It tickles us in a way. Why does it tickle us? So that um, food-related, apparently trivial example should, I think, uh, promote some kind of reflection. So final slide. What then are the diagnostic features of crypto-colonialism? And what make it, makes it different from post-colonialism and all the others? I'm going to suggest a list. And I'm going to say right again, right away again, the, the list is not meant to be a gatekeeping list to say this is and that is not post-colonial. Uh, crypto-colonial, I'm sorry. It is a way of saying here are the, the things that have led me to suspect that there are more forms of domination than simply straightforward colonial rule, and that the model of crypto-colonialism is just one of several that we might put into play with each other. The troubled monarchy and its association in many countries with a monastic tradition, the invocation of Western-derived models of an ancient past with cultural cleansing, leaning uh, leading towards a very impassioned defense of the ideal image of the country and the suppression in front of foreigners of what in fact nudge, nudge, wink, wink, we already know, which is what I mean by cultural intimacy. The idea of a unified national culture with clearly de designed and policed frontiers disguised local segmentary perceptions which are actually what animate ordinary people's everyday social interactions with each other and that are very much uh, in opposition to the formal top-down model of the bureaucratic state. A troubled relationship with notions of the West, Europe, etc. This is the other other, if you will. It's not post-colonial hostility for, and this is the final point, for the very good and simple reason that the countries that I have designated as crypto-colonial are never allowed to play a role in what I think of as the post-colonial grumbling club. It would be very hard to imagine Greece, Thailand, or even Afghanistan or Bhutan as 
participants in a post-colonial debate except by virtue of special pleading. If, therefore, you have equal difficulty understanding Iceland in those terms, then I think we might have some criteria that could help us use this model to uh, open up the complexities of Icelandic identity. So, as I said at the beginning, uh, I conclude simply by saying I'm here to learn. I want to hear about the Icelandic and related um, uh, uh, situations to try to understand uh, in this framework whether a model of this kind can in fact be useful for understanding a country that has had a very unusual trajectory in that it's a European state colonized by a European uh, country uh, that then left as a result of, of a vote which is certainly not what happened in some of these other cases. Um, and is, is it therefore post-colonial in relation to Denmark? Is it crypto-colonial in relation to English? I just heard that, that all PhD dissertations in this university are written in English. I find that very disturbing, frankly. And I think that that also argues uh, for a domination, a linguistic domination of the world uh, that is itself a phenomenon that can be studied separately from crypto-colonialism, but I simply want to say, ask yourselves whether this concatenation of ideas might be helpful uh, in revealing some of those complexities. Thank you very much indeed. And I look forward to it. Thanks very much for a very stimulating talk, a lot of uh, food for thought, forgive the pun, that we can sort of dig our teeth into on a North Atlantic plate later. But I think now that we have time perhaps for one question or, or a related comment uh, for Dr. Hatzfeldt, if there's someone. Yes, you there. Yeah, yeah, uh, Please introduce yourself. Yeah, so, uh, I'm from Denmark. Uh, and I don't know whether I'm first colonial or not. But uh, equally anticipated is uh, a talk now, uh, the second keynote, uh, by Kirsten Tiestet, who is the associate professor at the University of Copenhagen, an acclaimed researcher of Greenlandic literature and has published extensively on the processes of majorization and minorization, oral tradition and the entanglements between Denmark and Greenland. And Tista has also translated a number of Greenlandic novels into Danish. She is the leader of the uh, International Joint Research Project, Denmark and the New North Atlantic, which is visiting us and uh, having meetings here in, in Reykjavik about natural resources, cultural heritage, and identity positions in the formal Danish Commonwealth. And the title of Kirsten's uh, talk now is Imperial Ghosts in the North Atlantic, old and new narratives about the colonial relations between Denmark and Greenland. Please, Kirsten. Yeah, so I apologize for not taking you to Iceland, but to Greenland. So, in the opening of the book Damalat, The Land Behind the Sea from 1918, the ethnographer Louis Bobet tells the following story. A young Dane with the best connections in China at the time when the land of the Chinese had st still had an emperor was granted an audience with the foreign secretary and uncle of the Son of Heaven. The prince gives the young man a searching glance through slanted squinty eyes as he unrolls on the table in front of him a world map drawn in Mercator's projection. Please show me your king's land on this map, he says with a gesture of his hand. The young man bends with reverence over the map and searches with growing trepidation. Sweden, Norway, afraid and flimsy rabbit's food dangling over the European continent the peninsula of Jutland, a stylized, miserable knob or stump that could not possibly give the prince an advantageous and truthful impression of the extent of the Danish realm. 
unfortunately. He then sees in the top left edge of the map the mighty outline of Greenland, and he breathes a sigh of relief. Your Imperial Highness, this land is part of my king's realm. The prince nods his head slightly visibly impressed. Then your sovereign must be a powerful lord. This presentation is symptomatic of Danish reflections on the relationship with Greenland throughout the 20th century. On the one hand, relations between Denmark and Greenland are described as imperial in nature as the colonial power secures its own greatness through its overseas colonies. On the other hand, this discourse is undermined by the ironic portrayal of Denmark's role as imperial power. Any Dane will understand that Danish superpower dreams are merely fine. The young man's fall the temptation to enter a domain that is in fact alien to his own culture. The story is amusing to Danish readers because they know and share the Danish discourse about Denmark as a general and essentially anti-colonial realm in stark contrast to the sort of dominion the Chinese are seen to represent. Throughout the text, the Danes and, and Greenlanders are described as people of peace, and the Greenlanders are advised to hold on to the Danes with whom they are so much better off than with any of the less benign superpowers of the time. God preserve you, meaning the Greenlanders, from racially haughty Englishmen, business-driven Americans, and thrifty Germans. Nevertheless, dreams of superpower status is expressed in other passages of the book, for example, when the author proudly lists the colonial names on the Greenlandic map. Arve Prinsens Islander, Kronprinsens Island, Christians Hope, Juliane Hope, all memories from an era whose study has been my fondest preoccupation, Denmark's golden political and commercial age, when the Danish flag waved from the dark polar regions in the northernmost reach, reaches and all the way down to the Gold Coast, Trankebar, and the West Indies. Much water under the bridge since Bobby wrote his book. Today, Greenland has self-rule implemented in 2009, and Denmark and Greenland are reconstructing their relationship uh, around the new terms, partnership, equality, and mutual respect. These are the buzzwords in the Self-Government Act. So the old hierarchy within the North Atlantic, as visualized in this old poster where we find Greenland on the bottom, even under the slave ships of the Danish West Indians, are today being replaced by new images. I'm sure a lot of you know this uh, story about the Danish uh, colonial exhibition where the Icelanders got very, very angry um, to be uh, put on displays uh, online with um, Eskimos and Negroes. Uh, this is a well-known case, and it is Anne-Sophie Grimaud who has uh, dug this uh, wonderful image um, out of the archives, where you so clearly see the hierarchy with the uh, Greenlandic bear in the bottom. But this old hierarchy is now being replaced by this new image of a horizontal partnership between Greenland, the Faroe Islands, and Denmark. We all know that Iceland left this many years ago, this commonwealth. One could discuss if uh, <clears throat> this equality is actually signaled with this image. Uh, I don't know about that. Likewise, the common notion of the Danish realm, Kongeriet, has now been replaced with, uh, or the, the Danish realm uh, meaning, uh, or we, we use the term Rigsfællesskabet, the Danish realm. And this Rigsfællesskabet has now been uh, replaced with uh, Kongeriet, the Kingdom of Denmark, which is thought to be less imperial. Uh, I do not really know what I think about that either, but anyway, that is the philosophy behind this. As often demonstrated, however, old ghosts can be hard to lay to rest. Even today, we sometimes um, still encounter the rhetoric, which clearly reveals that imperial dreams are still alive, 
not least now that the melting ice cap is opening new Arctic shipping routes and providing easier access to oil and minerals. An interesting example is a Danish journalist, Martin Breum's book, Når isen forsvinder, when the ice disappears, Denmark as a superpower in the Arctic, Greenland's riches and the struggle for the North Pole is the full title in translation. The book is in fact intended as a critical study of the interweaving of royal power, military, business, science and politics. However, the author does not seem entirely immune to a certain polar fever. The phrase, the kingdom is expanding, is a recurring mantra, mantra throughout the text. In his uh, prologue to the, to the book, Breum describes a flight with a Royal Danish Air Force jet from Thule around the North Pole. He offers the following interpretation of the flight. Today, this small C-168 is the northernmost sparehead of the Danish realm. The plane reflects the determination of the Kingdom of Denmark to seize the new opportunities of the Arctic. Throughout, the prologue is held in the same slightly bombastic style, which marks a complete deviation from the Danish dogma of always speaking about peace and defense, and never about war, expansion, and conquest. Denmark and Greenland are expanding the kingdom all the way to the North Pole. Together, they will conquer a section of the seabed. The gradual disappearance of the ice has set the realm in motion. Danish warships patrol farther north than ever before in the 400 years that Denmark has confronted whalers, Norwegians, and Nazis in defense of their sovereign rights to Greenland. <coughs> <coughs> Expedition leaders from the heroic age are resurrected in all their glory, and a straight line is drawn to the modern scientists because of their contributions to Denmark's <coughs> assertion of sovereignty. The Danish polar hero Knud Rasmussen in particular is worth remembering, as he was, in Breum's words, a great asserter of sovereignty. Hence, his words are worth recalling in a modern context. As in, the <coughs> Sorry. As in the days of old, Denmark expands her domain when the opportunity arises. Already a hundred years ago, Knud Rasmussen's motto expressed the forcefulness of this drive, thank you, which does not necessarily know its goal, yet which is ever convinced of its aim. Forward. He who rests, rusts. The modern Danish polar explorers do not earn the same heroic status as those of the past, but their effort places them on the same track. In this rhetoric, Denmark's drive towards national self-assertion and expansion is virtually cast as a natural necessity, a hereditary urge passed down to the nation and to the proud men who incarnate it. The old national liberal rhetoric about Denmark to the Eider, which cost Denmark a painful defeat to Germany in 1864, and only caused the realm to shrink rather than to expand, is embraced and renewed in the updated slogan of Denmark to the North Pole. In that context, it is perhaps unsurprising that the new rhetoric about the Danish realm is sometimes forgotten and all hierarchies, hierarchies move to the foreground. The author clearly seeks to present the expanding realm as an equal partnership between Denmark and Greenland, something they are together in. Thus, the following sentence marks an unfortunate but telling slip of the pen. By virtue of her Greenlandic territory, Denmark's prime minister now can address the Arctic dilemmas directly in talks with the president of the United States. The statement, apart from being a slip of the pen, reflects a schism that is also present in the Self-Government Act. The parties in the Danish realm are equal, but the Danish state has a supreme authority on issues of foreign affairs and national security. 
These quotes all come from the expanded and revised edition of the book, which was released in 2013. The first edition from 2011 had none of this sort of rhetoric. It is possible that Breum has been influenced by the rhetoric that permeates the environments he has been studying so intensively and which he has been immersed in on long expeditions in the years between the two editions, both with military securing Dan Danish borders and with the scientists working on the Continental Shelf Project with the aim that the Kingdom of Denmark can identify potential claim areas and document the necessary data for submission to the United Nations, claiming the North Pole or at least part of it for the Danish Kingdom. Thus, in addition to the analysis presented in the book, the reader can also study how easily someone who is embedded in these environments can become a bearer of the narratives that prop up their justification. According to Paul Gilroy, the resurgence of imperial nostalgia could be interpreted as a manifestation of post-colonial melancholia. Since Denmark has not acknowledged its role as an imperial power, it has not been able to mourn the loss of its empire and achieve a sense of closure. Hence, all power relations and uh, rhetorical figures continue to haunt our interactions today and to pop up between the lines in the new text. From time to time, discussions in Greenland have suggested that Greenland and Denmark might benefit from a form of reconciliation and a confrontation with the events of the colonial era. Now it seems that such a process is indeed about to be initiated, at least internally in Greenland. While the first Greenlandic government after self-government in 2009 was very focused on the future, the newly elected government has made the colonial past part of the uh, coalition agreement, which includes this paragraph. It is necessary to reconcile and forgive in order to distance ourselves from the colonization of our country, there has to be an action plan for this. Actually, the Greenlandic text talks about putting the colonial era behind us, rather than to distance ourselves from it. So there is a deviation between the original text and the translation. Also, it is quite remarkable, of course, that the reconciliation process seems to involve only one part, namely the Greenlanders. However, the whole idea of such a reconciliation process is only in its initial stage. What I would be arguing is that the Danes need to become involved in this process, of course, but I will also argue that a thorough historical investigation based on the Greenlandic archives, as well as all other sources like diaries, letters, newspaper, literature, need uh, to be included in such a process. Because to fully understand what it is we need to reconcile and put behind us, we need a more specific knowledge about the nature of the colonial era. Not least because the narratives we create about the past has a great influence on the narratives we create about the future, including the ways in which we claim the Arctic and how we decide to relate to global warming and meet the threats and new possibilities opening up with the melting ice. Both in the political and the academic debate, two essentially obsolete discourses offer competing versions of the truth about the colonial relations. In one discourse which roots, uh, with roots in the 19th century, the Danish state always acts selflessly and in full accordance with the Greenlanders' wishes. This is that Denmark was never a real colonial power, it was colonialism with a human face version, the Louis Bobé version. In the other discourse, which mainly dates back to the anti-imperialism of the 1970s, the human face discourse is merely a hypocritical rationalization of the paternalism and oppression that was the essence of the colonial era and which continues to exist today now as neo-colonialism. Of course, this is also a discussion about pro et contra Danish exceptionalism. Was Denmark in fact a more benign colonial power or was it just as bad as all the others? However, this is not the discussion I want to open. 
to me, something far more important is at stake. Because as different as these discourses may seem, they share the underlying premise of Danes and Greenlanders belonging in separate categories and the premise of viewing the Danes as the agents of history while the Greenlanders are cast as history's passive objects. This is exactly what makes many young Greenlanders fed up with the constant discussion of the past. They need new and more positive identification models than the usual victimization theme. The archives offer excellent opportunities to rewrite Greenlandic history and to come up with new narratives where Greenlanders are positioned in roles far from the passive victims. Surely the colonial archives are the result of the will of the colonial power to govern and administer the colony, but the archives also bear witness to the cases when power relations become insecure and let us witness the strategic capacity of the Greenlanders who were in fact champions in what Homi Baba has called sly civility. Rather than open revolt, they opt for a strategy that accepts the current conditions while discreetly undermining and thus destabilizing the colonial structures of authority. And I would very much have liked to invite you on a small trip into the archives to show you an example of how this system, how this mechanics of sly civility worked, but time does not allow it. Time may allow me, however, to quickly show you a picture. What do we see in this picture? Furthest to the left is the head of Danish administration, Philip Rosendahl. Furthest to the right, his Greenlandic secretary, Peter Dahlager. On top of it all, the Danish flag, and we also notice the cannons representing the power and authority of the Danish state. But do these Greenlanders represent the suppressed colonial subjects? Or rather, a powerful Greenlandic majority deeply engaged in negotiating the power relations between themselves and the Danish state. I vote for the latter, and I do so by studying the biographies, letters, and writings of these strong and highly interesting men. Like here, Peter Dahlager, the one that you just saw in the picture, the secretary to the right, the secretary of the head of Danish administration. As expressed in this picture, Dahlager was a skillful cultural translator, situating himself in a mixture between what was considered Danish and what was considered Greenlandic. He was an expert in navigating in the space that opened in between cultures and not the least in between languages. So you may say that these people were in a colonial position, but that they wanted and worked to translate this situation into something what Herzfeld might call uh, crypto-colonialism, to press my luck a little bit <laughs> here. <laughs> to the best of my conviction, opening the archives will not only force the Danes to reformulate their narratives about the colonial past, it will likewise force the Greenlanders to question the present day's narratives about modernization, industrialization, and urbanization um, as something that was forced upon them upon, forced upon them by foreign new colonial power regimes. Without any doubt, colonial hierarchies and discourses defined the relationship between Danes and Greenlanders. Danes and Greenlanders were viewed as two distinct people, representing respectively a very high and a very low degree of civilization. The Danes eagerly inscribed themselves in the white man's burdens discourse and while the Icelanders and the Faroese were seen as the same genetic stock, there was a clear racial aspect when it came to the Greenlanders. The point is, however, that the narrative of cultural evolution was shared by the Greenlanders during the heyday of Danish colonialism. Compared to the material um, living conditions in Greenland, Denmark was a well-organized and far more appealing alternative at least the idealized image of Denmark that was held up to the Greenlanders. Therefore, the Danish superiority was a factor that the Greenlanders felt they had to live with for the time being and try to benefit from. The goal was to reach the same level of power and economic status 
no matter if the Danes played by the almost but not quite metaphor and based their regime on the conviction that that would be some utopia that would presumably never come true, considering the Greenlanders' starting point as a primitive or natural people. But the Greenlanders were convinced that they could turn the mother-child metaphor against the Danes. A child needs to grow up to become independent and to inherit the world. The Greenlanders wanted education, they wanted health care, they wanted a better law system, they wanted communication with the outside world, they wanted modernity. It was not until the 1970s when the Greenland left wing joined forces with the Danish left wing that the tables were turned against modernity. This was a time when the Western world was celebrating the indigenous people as a corrective to their own civilization. It was from then on, and only from then on, that the Greenlanders began to describe themselves as victims of modernization, industrialization, and urbanization, which had been introduced slowly up until 1953 and rapidly after 1953. 1953 was the year that officially ended the colonial era and included Greenland into the Danish realm. However, <clears throat> after 1979, when Greenland got home rule, and especially after self-government in 2009, the discourse of indigeneity has changed from a language of subordination and resistance to a language of governance. And that makes a huge difference. So, When the big oil companies are out there in the disco fjord drilling, it is not on behalf of some capitalistic foreign government. It is be on behalf of the Greenlandic government who has sold them licenses to do so. So Greenland is a, in a very different position from uh, the people that we normally consider indigenous people, and actually they are discussing now if they want to stay within that umbrella or what to do with this term. And that is a very interesting process to follow because is it possible for indigeneity to be a language of governance or is it strictly connected to subordination and resistance? Some might say that all this talk about reconciliation in Greenland these days is just some clever way to make people discuss something else than how this risk-taking business of drilling oil in Arctic deep waters and other highly dangerous, highly polluting activities match the image of the nature-preserving Inuit living in a snow-white, clean and unpolluted environment. However, looking into history and facing these unburied ghosts of empire might bring to light not only new narratives about the past, but maybe even new visions for the future. Greenland is presently dealing with much larger issues than a possible oil spill in the Disco Bay. Not that that is not <coughs> bad enough, of course. But there are rare minerals in the Greenlandic underground, we all know that. Unfortunately, these minerals cannot be harvested unless uranium is harvested and sold as a byproduct. The selling of the uranium could be discussed, but anyway, I do not intend to open a discussion here whether Greenland should start mining uranium or not. As it looks now, they probably will. But the fact is, and this is what is my question here. The fact is that it is impossible or next to impossible to have a discussion about it. In Greenland, it is very difficult to see any alternatives since economic autonomy is a prerequisite for full political autonomy. Considering the present not yet reconciliated colonial past, Political autonomy seems the ultimate goal which cannot be questioned in Greenland right now. Denmark has a long tradition for a zero tolerance politics for uranium. Until full Greenlandic independence, Greenland is still Danish soil, so this type of mining creates a diplomatic problem, which our prime minister in Denmark avoids 
by simply refusing to comment on the matter. Because in Denmark, we cannot discuss the matter at all. It's not, it's not that it's hard to discuss. It is that it is not to discuss. Due to the fact that any such discussion is considered neocolonial and an interference in internal Greenlandic affairs. So, so much for a partnership which is, at least at present, based on silences and taboos rather than openness and discussion. In this way, I claim that history and present day geopolitics are closely connected. A lot may be said about using the concept of reconciliation with all its connotation to mass atrocities in the Greenlandic context. But clearly, Denmark and Greenland need some kind of process. Call it reconciliation, call it clarification, whatever. But just something so that we can start talking to one another again. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tista, for that great keynote and leaving us with such an interesting conundrum. Um, we also have time, I think, for one question from the audience or, or comment um, before we move on to, to our panel. Anybody want to jump in with that? Mark, please, if you could introduce yourself as well. Hi, uh, Mark Lantine uh, with uh, Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, just have a question concerning uh, the current Greenland government, which has obviously positioned itself as much more populist, much more uh, interested in uh, possible greater autonomy in the future. Leaving aside the Iranian question, which is obviously a very uh, difficult one, there's also quite a bit of talk in Greenland about potential mining boom in other areas, everything from diamonds to gold and rubies. How do you see that potential economic change in Greenland status affecting the relationship with Denmark? But the whole, uh, the whole idea is, the hope, the vision is that it would create this economic autonomy which would leave Greenland in a position where they were free to choose if they wanted to stay within the realm or kingdom or what we want to call it. But it would make them truly equal because what is the problem now coming from this long past of colonial inequality? We have to, we have to admit that that is the case, right? The demand for a partnership that would really be equal is high, 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 right? It's the highest priority. But how do you become equal if all the time you have to ask, please send more money? So, so, so it's a very understandable thing that what you want is to be, to be economically self-supporting, and then you could join this partnership. <coughs> So of course they want to dig out diamonds and of course they want to, to use the oil. The problem right now is that in fact uh, none of it has come true yet. I mean everybody are talking about all the riches in the Greenlandic underground, but nothing, I mean the, the, the oil isn't exactly pouring out right now and they still need to pay their bills. So that is a big problem. Okay, so I think we uh, will end these keynotes with that, and Kirsten and, and Michael will join us for more discussion later, I hope. And uh, so we thank you both for those panels. Thank you. We will now have uh, two panels, one after the other, where uh, scholars will introduce their research shortly uh, with a short presentation and uh, then a, a further discussion with designated discussants um, after each panel. Uh, and to begin is Anne-Sophie Grimaud, who holds a PhD in uh, visual culture. She's a postdoctoral researcher and visiting scholar at the Edda Center of Excellence. She's affiliated with the University of Copenhagen and a part of the joint research project Denmark and the New North Atlantic. Her publications are mainly on crypto-colonial aspects on Icelandic culture and the role of art in the negotiation of national identity. And the title of her talk is To Be or Not to Be Post-Colonial, Iceland as Centre and Periphery.
this. It should be somewhere there on the. Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. It's good to uh, to be here with with you guys. We've been looking forward to combining these different aspects that are reflected in the keynote speeches. Um, I've been inspired by Michael Hertzfeld's work in my own research of uh, Icelandic nation building and international relations since I commenced my doctoral research that was published in the thesis with an English translation, Cryptocolonial Landscapes, last year. Today I'll briefly sweep over some points from my recent uh, work. Denmark has been a not always explicit, but nonetheless significant other in formations of Icelandic national identity. In the 19th, 20th and 21st centuries um, in Iceland have been characterized by nationalist currents, resulting in the complex disruption in the relationship between Denmark and Iceland. The rising nationalism and independence movement in Iceland caused a a redefinition of how to draw the lines between the inside and the outside of the perceived collectives of Denmark and Iceland. Whereas the nature and importance of the relationship between Denmark and Iceland was high on the agenda in both countries before the separation, the discussion has since largely fallen silent. The silence and seeing of this issue has become so complete that one can still meet Danes who are not sure about the current nature of the political bonds between the countries, and some are even unsure as to whether Iceland is still in fact a Danish dependency. Thus, the obscurity has developed to such an extent that it caught my attention as well as that of other scholars. There's no doubt that the ties to Denmark and other significant power factors have shaped Icelandic society and culture, as has also the limited focus on the aspect of this history. Slavoj Žižek has criticized post-colonial studies for reducing economical inequalities and structures to pseudo-psychological questions of otherness and projections. But the theory of crypto-colonial relations, as presented in Michael Herzfeld's writings, can undoubtedly contain both these aspects. Due to economical and imperial structures, as well as myths connected to the region, Iceland has for long been perceived as being situated in the geographical periphery of the far north, an area that can be said to have functioned as a buffer zone in a European perspective towards the cultural and ethnic other, the Inuit. The connotations attached to this geographical position have varied, both in inter internal and external depictions depending on shifting economical and ideological trends and shifting power centers. Icelandic historian and a colleague here at the university and present here today, Sumalid Islevson, has identified a number of dominant stereotypical ideas about the North. Notions that are still pre prevalent in images of Iceland in our century are, for example, the utopian North, a life in balance with nature, the original North, where customs lost in Europe still thrive, and the wealthy north, a place of natural and cultural abundance. As Hertzfeld has pointed out, one feature that all these crypto-colonial societies share is an aggressive promotion of their claims to civilizational superiority or antiquity, claims that almost always appear disproportionate to their political influence. This feature is quickly recognized when examining Icelandic cultural history. During the independence movement, focus was on being recognizable as a nation equal to the world's dominant sovereign states. This diagram from the World Fair of 1905 clearly illustrates the ideological context of the time marking the Eurocentric and imperialist hierarchy in which the nation, Icelandic nation was forming. The crypto-colonial perspective also sheds light on current dynamics uh, of Iceland being viewed as spiritual cultural source on one hand and ep economical and political outsider on the other, a perspective that could also be ground for a comparison between Greece and Iceland. 
The crypto-colonial optics aids us to investigate um, the consequences of the strong interest in Iceland's distant past and consequences of the utopian, dystopian and heterotopian con connotations of its geographical position on the modern identity formation. When looking at significations of temporal and spatial dimensions in all areas of visual culture, one can see projected ideas and aspirations connected to collective identity. The crypto-colonial perspective makes us sensitive to statements about time and space and how new boundaries have continuously been drawn and redrawn between the inside and outside of collectives and how new self-images are created through renegotiations of external fantasies and by functionalization of memory. Iceland has been a unique country seen from Northern Europe as it's been viewed as a haven or shrine for cultural heritage and even as a living past. The strong associations with the past as an aspect of the original North has been reappropriated in commercial visual culture. After centuries of objection to primitivism and exotification associated with being of the past, there are recent examples of Icelandic branding that embraces the position as, quote, those who apparently have not fully crossed the threshold to modernity, unquote, as Kristin Skram has once put it. Apart from being a clever commercial strategy, Norientalist self-exotification has been used as an identification strategy also to cope with internal ruptures that are the consequences of modernity. Iceland as a place of otherness as an, and an international heterotopia that is a place of that that is different is a brand that has proven very sellable in the experience economy. The Frankfurt Book, Book Fair in 2011, where Iceland was a guest of honor, was an example of a scene that was used for rebranding Iceland after the crisis, where old ideas about the original and utopian North were once again relaunched. After the, uh, the, sorry, the years after the collapse in 2008 have also been used as a motor for reinvest, reinvestigations of the deeper structures of Icelandic society including some, some long-term implications of the Danish past, um, yeah, of the past as a Danish dependency. The position as an in-between, an either-or on the modern political scene has meant that Iceland has had to cope with real consequences of international power relations and imperialism, as well as the exposed position between the superpowers of the Cold War. This has led to what's had what Herzfeld has described as the unfavorable development patterns of many crypto colonies. As he says, this has enabled local elites to maintain their grip on powers in way that elsewhere has proven vulnerable. In an article from 2009, the Icelandic journalist Iris Erlingsdóttir directed a very sharp critique against the country's rulers with a rare post-colonial angle. She said, the passivity learned from the colonizers has prevented any meaningful action by the people. And she continues, as Nobel Prize author Haldor Kilian Laxness observed, Iceland's colonial overlords nationalities simply changed from Danish to Icelandic. Erlingsdóttir then quotes the American politician Ram Emanuel's dictum, you should never waste a crisis. And the collapse and the following crisis certainly holds potential as an entrance to investigations of the views on the past and the deeper layers in identity construction. The old notion of the original North and the utopian North are reintroduced in ideas about Iceland in many current branding strategies, in political and corporate messages, expressing ideas about the future relationship between nature and society in Iceland and the region. The images promoted in the past of being a cultural cradle of Northern Europe has had a long time side effect of hiding or obscuring the actual nature um, of social structure and the state of Icelandic democracy. Strategies after the crisis to find a place as something else than a pariah state has led to a promotion of the country as a place of uniqueness, a heterotopia, and even sometimes a utopia. 
Another strategy is positioning the country within the Arctic region in the making. Here the official iconography and rhetorics place Iceland in the Arctic region as a north par excellence or a super north, a leading power of the region. In a historical perspective, the divide between the perceived Germanic north and the Inuit has influenced the region's relations between Iceland and Arctic neighbors such as Greenland. As historian Guðmundur Haldanason has shown, the discussions in 1911 of founding a university in Iceland was preoccupied with using such an institution to consolidate Iceland's status as a civilized society equal to other nations. And notably, as a means to eventually leave the society of Atlantic islands that was referred to in the time as the society of barbarians in the parliamentary debate. The current governmental policy that rhetorically places Iceland as a leader, Leiðan de Apl, can be interpreted as a re-identification with the region and yet another step in the direction laid out in the age of nation building. Official policy concerning energy and resources is reflected in the statements sent out by the public energy provider Orkuveta. Orkuveta's official brand is, is based on rhetorical and iconographical associations with purity. In the material, the company as well as the nation is linked with purity. The promotional material shows icy landscapes and waterfalls, followed by the diagram where pure energy is linked with Iceland, as opposed to foreign energy. Finally, it's emphasized that, emphasized that Iceland is famous globally for providing pure energy. Being associated with the periphery in the Danish realm governed by, uh, from Copenhagen and in relation to other European power centers, as well as, as with the center, as a cradle for Germanic culture, has created some interesting crypto-colonial dynamics in Icelandic society for centuries. The current suggestions of a new center or Arctic Mediterranean, as suggested by Valud Engimundersson, thus pushes what is considered the periphery further north. These trends in geographical narratives have opened up a field where new associations with the Arctic and Iceland are forming reciprocally. In an economy that rewards images association with the pristine through the cash flow of tourism and export on the basis of brand value, and at the same time rewards activities that alter increasingly large areas of wild nature, Iceland is benefiting from its unique image. The ideas of pure nature associated with Iceland's image are supported by the powerful and widespread stereotypes of the North. The centuries-long tradition of depicting Iceland as a special or even heterotopical place in Western civilization and as a pristine wilderness has the potential to fo focus as a smokescreen, hiding exploitationist practice from a green perspective. This potential is dangerous, not least in policies concerning the future of the Arctic region and the voices of artists and other critics still only make out a very timid island in the ocean that is the consumer, fishery and tourism-based industry. I'll conclude here with a slide that shows you elements from artworks, recent ones, by Hlinur Halsson and Ås Kvilliamsdottir, two artists who are critical towards the clean discourse of Icelandic energy production and the Icelandic image as a haven for pristine landscape or a utopian and wealthy north. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne Sophie. Um, you can either take a seat here or if you want to watch the PowerPoints from, yeah. from the floor. Um, we will be holding all questions until the end of, of, of the panel. And for those of you who are starting to long for coffee, we will have a coffee break after this panel. Uh, but moving on to the, the next uh, speaker, uh, Olavur Rastrik is a cultural historian, an uh, adjunct lecturer in ethnology and a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of History at the University of Iceland. He has published on Icelandic nationalism, cultural policy and the politics of the national body. Uh, his talk is entitled Imagining Greenland as an Icelandic Colony, 1924-1955. And here he is.
Thank you, Christian. Good afternoon. As has already been highlighted so clearly by the previous speakers, um, current claims to the north are made in the context uh, of historical circumstances. Some of the historical processes and uh, perspectives are well known and apparent when dealing with present day issues, other are less so. Issues that have been pushed off the historiographical radar, dismissed as obscure and unimportant of no relevance to our present concerns. Uh, what I'm going to do is, is to remind you of one such uh, case which at least Icelandic historians to date have uh, had very little to say about, often dismissing it as an ill-conceived concern of a single eccentric uh, scholar. Um, perhaps this case of Icelandic imperialist dreaming has received little attention in the recent years because it uh, does not sit well with uh, the present self-image of the Icelandic state as a supporter of self-determination of underprivileged nations. Iceland pr prides itself, for instance, uh, for being the first to recognize the independence of the Baltic <coughs> states in the 1990s. So I'm thinking of Denmark as a superpower is perceived ironically. Thinking of Iceland as a colonial power is simply ludicrous. <laughs> the story goes roughly like this. In the 1920s, following Iceland's descent to sovereign nationhood in 1918, the question of whether and why Greenland should become an Icelandic colony was hotly debated by intellectuals and politicians in Iceland. The subject became addressed in the parliament and a significant amount of articles and essays, books, doctoral theses appeared uh, locally on the Greenland issue. The reason why this uh, emerged in the 1920s is related to the debates between Norway and Denmark about Eastern Greenland, Norwegians <coughs> having uh, had ties uh, there and the Danes seeking to limit foreign fisheries around Greenland. Despite the ruling of the World Court on the legal status of Eastern Greenland in 1933, assigning uh, sovereign power in Greenland to the Danish state exclusively, Iceland has continued to rehearse claims uh, to Iceland well into the 1950s, interest only fading after the uh, constitutional status of Greenland being altered in 1953, with Greenland being defined as an integral part of Denmark. So what I found curious about the uh, Greenland's Maulid, as it was uh, known uh, locally, the Greenland issue, uh, is how so many intellectuals, politicians, etc., could dream up this scheme of making Greenland an Icelandic col colony only a few years after the country had, has, had uh, assented to the stati status of independency. Especially as at this time, the uh, thrust of uh, Icelandic historical narratives was all about the perils of foreign colonization. Iceland had, according to the dominating historical discourse at the time, after years and years of struggle, finally succeeded in freeing itself uh, from the paralyzing chains of Danish domination. And yet, this idea of colonizing Greenland seemed to gain quite widespread attention. So what prompted such claims being made on behalf of this tiny nation, which seemed from the local perspective to be all too familiar with the perils and liabilities of foreign rule? Why did people in Iceland, having just emerged from colonial status of sorts, 
to a post-colonial or crypto-colonial situation, start imagining Greenland as an Icelandic colony. Um, let's look briefly at the main uh, arguments. They were historical and they were legal. Um, people from Iceland had settled in Greenland in the Middle Ages. They were not Norwegians, but they were Icelanders. Greenland was part of the Icelandic legal system, our laws from the 10th century. And the uh, same kind of legalistic claims were used, uh, that were used in the 19th century to make claims for Iceland's independence from the emerging Danish nation state, uh, were used with reference to Gamli Sartmali, the agreement between Icelanders and the Norwe Norwegian king in uh, 1262, and so on. So, Iceland had a historical and legal right to Greenland. Um, the cultural aspect, which had been very important for, for, the, for the independence movement in, in Iceland, was however not to see, seem to be applicable uh, here, for obvious reasons. The existence of a local population in Greenland did thus not amount to much in the discourse of the spokesmen for the Icelandic colonization of Greenland. People like Benedictson and the most prominent advocate of the matter, Jón Duason, only fleetingly refer referred to the indigenous population, generally referring to them as Skrælingjar, the same term as was used in the Nordic medieval literature. Mostly they seem to regard Greenland as terra nullus, uh, not only not belonging to anyone uh, before the settlers from Iceland arrived. When referring to Greenlanders at all, it was often, uh, uh, more often than not in the terms of the need for modernization to save them from the not humane but the inhumane treatment of the Danes, uh, that the Icelanders were supposedly better fitted uh, to uh, instruct to lead the uh, the Greenlanders, being more familiar uh, with the uh, and have more understanding of, uh, for instance, farming in such harsh climate conditions that could be found uh, similarly in Iceland and Greenland. Now, I must say that, that this perspective did not go unchallenged. The Copenhagen-based historian Oye Melsted expressed the view already in 1924 that the Greenland issue was the most disgusting matter on the political agenda and stressed uh, that Icelanders, if anyone, should appreciate that uh, it was only the Greenlandic nation that could be considered the rightful owners of Greenland. So what... Uh, I've nearly finished, actually. So what... Uh, prompted the interest of the Icelandic parliament. In some form or other, Greenland's, the Greenland issue was taken up by the Althingi most years well into the 1950s. Economic prospects most certainly, but I'm not going to, to uh, say anything about that here. There was also something else. In 1925, the chairman of the Parliamentary Committee on the Greenland issue stated when advocating the necessi necessity of the matter 
I believe it is healthy and useful for the nation to have great and vit virtuous matters to work on, matters that can join together her strengths and enhance her awareness for independence. Enough persists that scatters and creates discord. So the real resolution of the question of national independence in 1918 left a sort of, sort of a vacuum in Icelandic politics. There was no longer a political agenda that could unite the local community, none which seemed to generate the same unisonic feeling as the quest for national independence. Politics were turning into class politics. The idea of Icelanders as a unit, united family was being put to the test. And uh, in, uh, in that respect, claiming Greenland seemed to be like a logical next step, a logical continuation of the struggle for Icelandic independence. And I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oliver. Um, our next speaker is Ian Watson. He is Assistant Professor of Social Sciences at Biverest, has a PhD from Rutgers and a BA from Harvard in Scandinavian Linguistics. He is a board member also of the Consumers Association of Iceland, and his talk is titled Postcolonial Echoes in the Icelandic Consumer Experience. Thank you.